and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of Westlands, the 2D6 system RPG, which he, which he offered for only one buck, one deer, one roadkill, I'll stop now, the one and only William Murakami at Brundage. I'm hoping I got that right. Straight out of the Menagerie Press. Yeah. How you doing yeah. today, man? I am good. I am good. That was... uh. One hell of an introduction, sir. That is a, uh, you know, I imagine people speaking in tongues and falling down in the aisles while rolling d20s there. That is amazing. So, I tip my hat to you. I don't need to. I only need, I only speak I only speak in tongues when I when um when I feel, when I want when I want to when I want to make fun of the when make fun of the more obstinate people in the family. And besides, I don't, I, I don't speak, I don't speak in tongues around them. I speak in Morse code. <laughs> right, right. You know, my, uh, my grandfather has passed away. He was a pastor, and, and and there was those tongues speaking, but it was just shy of that. So it was a, it was a interesting discussion, you know, where uh, my hobbies were verboten at the table, like. Uh, no, uh, I think I think he was pushing it when playing Monopoly, so he sure didn't want to hear about me writing games about you know containing demon summoning magic and stuff. Like to him, that was curling his curling his hairs, you know. So no, but the, no, but it's perfectly fine to play to play the board game equivalent of a death march. Right, right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I, I can play. I can play the hyper capitalist simulator Monopoly, where you know your first ten turns pretty much determine your outcome at the end. But as soon as I start throwing imagination in there, I'm going to hell. So it was a. Uh... Um, there are always two board games that I that I consider to be the equivalent of torture. Monopoly is one of them. The other one is Jenga. Both of them, I believe, should be violations of the Geneva Conventions for torturing non-combatants. Right. Oh, Jenga's interesting because I guess they're actually role playing games. I've never played them. But my my friends have basically given me the thirty second elevator spiel. Yeah. About how um you know it's a horror game and and you sub and and every time a crucial moment comes up you subtract a Jenga piece and when the tower collapses something dramatic happens. Oh my god. So it's a yeah. uh, it's a it's a unique mechanic. I, I applaud them for using it, but man, it's a uh, nerve wracking. So, well, if it, well, if it well, it's a horror game, so it comes with the territory, right? right. right. It's not like baking cookies. Fair enough. So, mm -hmm. oh, so I'd like to open at the humble beginnings, in a sense. Um, what's what? What was your introduction to role playing, and what made it stick? So, do you mean? Do you mean? Uh, let's, let's 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 hop on the wayback machine here. Um, do you mean my very first role playing game experience, or do you mean my first experience writing stuff? Let's go with the former and there. then with the latter. Sure, sure. So let's let's hop in go back to a time where I was about, gosh, I don't know, I was maybe five or six, like I was young, mm -hmm. um, and I had a my sister and I had a babysitter. I, I, this is so long ago, I actually don't really remember her name. Mm -hmm. I can kind of visualize her um, in that vague, like, misty, it's been decades since I recalled her face kind of thing. She was someone. But she, she is, my daughter says, she was someone. That's, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and I don't think she had any idea about the impact she was going to make on my life. But she got tired of chasing my sister and I around the house when she was babysitting. So she had a solution, and you know this was this was probably like eighty four, right? So D and D had existed for a while, but it was not super well known. It was it was it was kind of heading into that first wave of uh eighty four. You know, so that meat. would be um red box. It, yeah, it, I'd say I'd say that'd be um that'd be ju that'd be just as 
as um second was start was starting to make noise, yeah, give or exactly. take a few years. Um, exactly. Advance had, yeah. Advance had already been out by a few by a few years by that point. Yes, she had the red box game. Um, yeah, so that'd be Beck me. Yeah, the like, Beck me system exactly the basic expert companion master. Yeah, exactly immortal. For those of you who really care to delve that deep. Um, yeah, I I, br- I have to bring this kind of thing up because whenever someone says that they they got started with um with early D and D, I I have to remind them that does not narrow it down much because there's five different versions of, of um right. of ori- of right. original D and D. Oh, it's true. You could be talking anything from Red Box Basic Set with the uh, the solo adventure in the book to. Second edition to chainmail to the little white butt pamphlets that were printed in such a short chain- run that they hardly. I don't exist. count chainmail. Chainmail was <laughs> um, chainmail was a whole different thing because of how big the war gaming scene was back in the seventies. Um, right, especially right. when Avalon Hill owned everybody, at least Avalon at least here Hill. in the states. But the versions, yeah. the lineage that I usually go by is white box, Moldave, Cook, BX, Beckme. Beck me being the last one and probably the most accessible to those outside of the Midwest. Yeah. Yeah, it was really I you know, it still has a regional impact where uh the the Midwest holds the biggest conventions, the the biggest prestige conventions like Gen Con and mm-hmm. you know, Origins and everything. But anyways, uh I'm digressing. I'm tangenting. A little early to be tangenting. Oh, I tangent uh, all anyways, the time so on I had my a show. Babysitter. Right, <laughs> excellent. I had a babysitter, uh, and she got tired of chasing my sister and I around the house. So she convinced us that we were going to play a game, and we sat down and we played Dungeons and Dragons. Right, mm-hmm. and I was hooked. Oh my gosh! Like I was, I was hooked with such a fierce, like spirit to this game. Right, like it was, it was intense because, like at the time, like you were talking, you had GI Joe, you had He Man. Mm-hmm. Transformers, like you had all these cartoons, but like here's a moment where, me, you know, me myself is like this young child could step into the mindset of not only being in like an adventure, but like being the focus of the adventure. Like I was the hero, right? And and my friends were also heroes, and we were sharing this story, and it was such a such a revolutionary moment in my mind. Um, that this was even potentially possible. Like, I'd never encountered a game that was uh, collaborative and cooperative, Mm -hmm. much less unfocused around stories instead of, you know, uh, bean counting or, you know, resource management. Um, So that was my first introduction. Actually, uh, the first adventure that we ran was uh, Palace of the Silver Princess, which is B3, I think, B1. Mm -hmm. It's a really early... It's like it's not the basic set adventure, but it's one of the ones that comes shortly afterwards. Um, and it was it was such an eye opener, right? There are NPCs. There's a pair of roguish NPCs you meet who are looting this palace, and uh, we allied with them, and they ended up stealing my gold. Um, and it was just like these things could happen, and it was mm-hmm. such a such a, such a mind blowing moment. I, I don't even know how to describe it. Um, you know, and then fast forward. So I was, you know, six or so. Yeah. Uh, fast forward maybe six years, right? I think I was in like roughly sixth grade. Um, and I submitted an article to Dragon Magazine. So that was the first, first, like that was my first shot over the bow of publishing something, right? And I was, I was in middle school, and I, I typed this up, and it, I still remember it, it was. It was a, a bunch of gauntlets, like plate armor, chain armor, metal armor gauntlets. Mm-hmm. It basically had or mimicked the effects of Dragon's Breath weapons, right? So, like, you know, and it was a series of five of them, each for the chromatic dragons, right? And it was basically, you know, these these gauntlets would allow someone to, you know, throw a cone of fire, or a cloud of poisonous gas, or, you know, whatever the chromatic dragon breath weapon was. Um, and I submitted it, and I sent it off, and I typed it up. I, you know, I, I uh, 
printed it out because a family member had access to a printer, like a dot matrix, like a mm-hmm. you know, dot matrix printer. And I printed it out and I tore the little ribbons off the side so I could fit the paper in the envelope. Because, you know, at the time it had like spools on the sides, like, like feeder spools that you had to strip off before you used it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I mailed it off. And, uh, of course, Dragon Magazine rejected me. Um, uh, they were like, ah, we don't really have a use for this at this time. But, but I, 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 you know, that was, that was probably my first attempt to publish something. Um, and I, my proofreading was, of course, non-existent because I didn't even, it didn't even occur to me I should have someone look this over. Um, nor did I have any friends who probably could have looked it over because I was the forever GM even at sixth grade, right? Um, mm-hmm. I still remember one of my friends opening up. So, so he was like, let me see the Dungeon Master's Guide. I was like, well, you can see it, but I don't want you reading it because, you know, there's a lot of stuff in there I don't want you to know. And he's one of my players. And uh, so he took it and he was like, well, and he opens it up and he looks inside and he's looking probably at like, oh my God, like one of the random encounter, like dungeon generator tables where it's like, you know, on a percentile dice roll of 71 to 79, you encounter a corridor that is 1d10 times 10 feet long or whatever. And it was just, mm-hmm. and, and he literally looked at it and he said, this is just numbers and handed it back to me. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right that was uh the, it highlighted it highlighted the difference of thinking between game design and playing right right there that's it in a nutshell mm-hmm. um, yeah and then you know so that was sixth grade i had sent stuff off to dragon they weren't having it but then you know as i got older i i, I stopped gaming for probably I don't know. Uh, fourth, fourth edition, actually. I know when I stopped gaming. It was when fourth edition came out. Um, so, you know, there's a gap from whenever to 2008 or whatever to 2015. Maybe before 2008. But the timing gets fuzzy. Um, I didn't play much Pathfinder, which is sad. Um, weirdly, I hardly even knew it existed, which was kind of bizarre. That I had this... D and D three point five size gap in my awareness of role playing games, so I didn't learn Pathfinder existed until two thousand thirteen, right when I started gaming again with some friends and I started running some Pathfinder Society stuff because it was easy, it was accessible, um, I could get people on board to play, and and if I if I lost a player or two, I could replace that player, um. So organized play ended up being very beneficial for someone like me who has sparse time and maybe a somewhat erratic schedule. Um, and then I started playing AL in 15, 16, maybe 17, uh, uh, somewhere in there. I want to say about 2016. Um, and I played t- t- Tales, Trees Tell, which is a classic 0108. It's an old adventure. Um Season one of AL for fifth edition, the mm-hmm. Wizards of the Coast organized play system. Um, and then shortly after that, shortly after that, um, the AL program started a community content creator program. Um, and I I learned about it and I hounded everybody I could get a hold of at Wizards of the Coast and then the AL program. Until someone finally said, okay, we'll let you write something, right? Like, like this program, like, the ink was still wet on the page as far as, like, we're going to allow this. And I was knocking on their proverbial door and saying, hey, you know, I saw this thing in the paper, basically. I was like, I was there. And I wasted no time in uh, getting stuff out. And um, it was funny because, actually... I wrote my first official organized play adventure. It's probably also the first actual adventure, one of the first adventures I wrote in any adult capacity. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, my friend Ian Pace and I, we wrote it in the period of maybe eight weeks. 
it was a crash course like like we we went from nothing to finish thing in like 40 days right it was it was swift and then it premiered at a convention called pdx age in portland oregon and there are two of them uh the white well was the level one to four adventure and the dark hunt was the level five to ten adventure um and and then I mean, and once I did that, and I realized that I could do that, and I realized that um, I was really going to be able to produce things, um, like mm -hmm. that, you know, that that just like we were talking about before you started recording, right? That Renaissance moment had happened, and now creati creativity is is you know it's it's unleashed. You know, if you want to produce a role-playing game book, you can do it with enough time and effort. You don't have to spend a lot of money. You don't have to have a friend in New York who can set you up with a publishing company. Like you can, you can just do it. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's that's really was was eye-opening to me. It was, you know, again, my mind was blown. You know, thirty years after my, my mind, mind was blown. exactly my mind gets blown a lot, as my daughter just said. Right? It seems like you're. Mine's getting blown a lot, Dad. Um, but yeah, you know, thirty years after my first moment of of, of uh, RPG awareness, you know, I, I had another revolutionary moment in my consciousness, and, mm -hmm. and, and is is basically the equivalent of like an RPG come to Jesus moment. And said it was all about Cambians wielding dark, sinister rapiers. So you know, take it with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. Now. <laughs> It's uh, going from a lot of going from a lot of of a D and D background to a two D to a two D six background, especially since you bring up both Traveler and sort of Cepheus. Um, how familiar were you with tra with Traveler and sort and sort of Cepheus? Right. Yeah. Good call. Um. So, uh, Traveler, I was. Fairly well acquainted with the science fiction version, um, uh, because uh, around the same time that I was, yeah, sixth grade, right? I had a friend I would hang out at his house, um, and his dad was like this geek, right? His dad before geek was really a thing that occurred. He was he, like the word wasn't there to describe him, but he had he had a collection of all kinds of stuff. He had like the TMNT books, like Road Hogs. And after the bomb, and his dad had this, and his dad was really like, if you see a book and you want to read it, read it. Like, don't hold back, right? He wasn't like, these are my books, go get your own. He was like, you know, just try to remember to put it back on the shelf. Mm -hmm. Um, when you're when you're try to remember where you got it on the bookshelf, but if you don't, we'll figure it out. Um, and uh, so he had the traveler black books the little booklets right they were and they look almost like pamphlets they're not very thick they all have black covers with like a bold primary color outline um and he had several of those and so i would sit around and make characters and experience the joy and the sorrow of a decent character dying during character creation mm-hmm um and it it happened like yeah i and uh there's actually also a traveler computer game that I think came out roughly, I'm going to say like 87, 88. It was around the same era as Ultima 4. Um, right? So, uh, in that kind of zone. Mm -hmm. And the Traveler computer game was very true to the Traveler system, which is of course not hard, because the 2D6 mechanics are relatively simple compared to like high fantasy. Um, and so the Traveler computer game was really interesting because it shared so much of the mechanics and it made them obvious how they were working so like uh you know if you went out of the airlock on a planet without the right kind of spacesuit you instantly died mm -hmm. and there was no heads up hey you might want to have the right suit no like if you wandered out on a barren planet in street clothes you just died as soon as you hit the airlock so it was it was as unforgiving as you would expect any traveler computer game to be Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, there are things like, uh, you know, your jump ships and whatnot. So I was more familiar with the Traveler version of things, very much so. Um, 
And you know, uh, I like Traveler. It's a good game. It's a really good game. It's 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 earned its its stripes, so to speak. You know, like uh, it's got a lot of mileage. Mm. It has not changed fundamentally very much in any way, shape, or form since it first was created. Like it was it was functional from the get go. Yeah, I like, um, I ended up rev- I ended up because I do a lot of reviews. I ended up reviewing um, Mongoose's second edition take at on um, Traveler, sure. which I liked, but I think I think they um, made a bit of a mistake by tr- by trying to cram everything in one book. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there's a lot of Traveler material, especially if you get into like the psychic, the Zodani, and things like that. Then there's a whole setting kind of aspect that can be separated from the mechanics um and the the black books were very much about mechanics like you know there's a little book devoted to a star solar solar slash planet system generation and you know each book basically focused on a different aspect of traveler um sort of cepheus is newer yeah it is it's only been around for a few years yeah, I was gonna say I want to say it came around roughly 2017, um, because I I saw it, I heard about it somewhere, I don't even remember where, and my friend sent me a link and said, "Hey, I know you're looking for a low fantasy, but not no fantasy, right? A low fantasy kind of uh, dangerous magic Conan ish, you know, Aquilonian Hyperborea setting for your." For your game, there's a mouthful. So check this out. <laughs> there, if he actually said it like that, that's one hell of a mouthful. Well, he wrote me. He wrote me. Uh, you know, but but his gist was check this out, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I checked it out, and I was like, damn, like they nailed it. Like Omar and his crew, they nailed it. Like it was, it was good. It was good. And and you know, having played Traveler, I could kind of see how things would play out, and I was like, this is really got some good bones to it you know like Mm -hmm. this is a functional system and i actually ran uh cepheus i i i had a warhammer game warhammer and we originally started playing warhammer fourth edition fantasy fourth edition Mm -hmm. but it was super clunky it kind of reminded me and i don't mean to you know diss warhammer um but the warhammer fourth edition thing had you know, the ammo types do different damage depending on what kind of gun you're firing from. And, you know, your percentile dice do different things depending on your weapon attributes. And I was just like, I was swimming. I was up to my eyeballs in Warhammer variables. And I was like, I was like, in, you know, my table, my players, we just came to the consensus that the, the mechanics were getting in the way of the story that mm-hmm. we wanted to play, right? Um, and so when Cepheus came about, I was, I was like, Hey, what do you think about this? You know, did the whole, like, you know, the person holding up both hands towards the book, like, Hey, take a look at this, you know? And, uh, they, they, they were at first, they were uh, not tentative, you know, but they were like, ah, you know, we think it'll work. But after we played, they're like, this is really simple. Like they were, they were, they were more enamored with the fact that, um, was quick resolution it was quick quick resolution right like you could decide your actions and move on with your story you could well you could decide your course of action resolve your course of action and continue forward without having to get bogged down in pluses and minuses and factors and variables and did you hit or did you not Mm -hmm. um and so it, it worked it worked um, and you know, that's when I kind of tinkered with it and I came up with what turned into Westlands, right? Where, uh, it's kind of like, you know, I don't like the foci system in, in, uh, Cepheus because it leads to a little bit of this whole, like, magical item hoarding, bean counting, um, you know, how many arrows do I have in my quiver kind of thing. And it didn't really grok with the essence of what I viewed magic as. So I viewed magic as like this wild, tempestuous, chaotic element um, that, you know, foolish sorcerers drew on for power and more cautious wizards were very uh, circumspect about using, right? Like a long-lived wizard is probably someone who doesn't 
exert their magical force unless they need to. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, the, the foci were basically like these one shot or permanent elements that let you successfully cast a spell. And I was like, I don't really like it. So that's when I started tinkering with Westland's, what would be Westland's kind Mm -hmm. of, come up with this idea of um you know how can i how can i keep the spirit of magic and not you know get into you know throwing fireballs and wish spells but um make it you know but but not water it down so it's just i cast magic missile 50 times during the fight and then the fight is over yeah um Right, and so the magic and so when i changed the magic system that's when i kind of realized hey you know i could can maybe make something of this and i talked to my friends and you know kind of went back and forth and tinkered with stuff for a while um and then i i wrote stella gama stella gama publishing who handles cpius and cpius deluxe or cpius and cpius deluxe and i wrote them uh and i said hey um and i didn't want to be absolutely clear i was like this says this is this is uh you know, this book, they basically said, is open content. I checked with them. I'm like, do you really mean that this is all open content? Like, like I can do whatever I want with this? And they were like, yes. They were like, absolutely. You can do whatever you want with this material. Like, like we are not restricting. It's, there's, you know, we're not like, uh, yeah, I mean, I can't copy their art. You know, but it's not like, uh, you know... Uh, you can only use this section. We're reserving beholders, carrying crawlers, and the lithids for ourselves, so get lost if you want to use them, right? Um, which is actually what Wizards of the Coast has done with their SRD. They have a segment of terms that you are truly not allowed to use. Um, and and I think Selagema's only limitation is I'm not allowed to use their titles in my stuff simply because... I think that they got permission to use the titles from someone else. So it's a little bit of uh, six degrees of separation, right? So I, mm-hmm. uh, so that's why I called it Westlands, which is, you know, the homage to um, not only the West Marches, but the Pacific Northwest where I live. So, yeah, I can, and I can certainly get, be- I can certainly get behind that. Um, now, Given that, given that, and you mentioned, you mentioned that you're try that the style that you're going for is more of a West Marches style, and while I'm familiar with that, um, I do think it's important to lay the groundwork as to what that is because it's one of those things you can't assume that people know because you know what they say about assuming. Right. Exactly. It's it's a awkward word. Um, yeah, no, so, so West Marches in, I mean, I think it's someone laid it out. Maybe it was, who laid it out? Um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on his name. Uh, the strong, I think the fellow who did it is the same fellow who did the strongholds and, and, uh, book on Kickstarter. Oh my gosh, I'm under pressure and I can't remember well, his name. There's um, plenty of people who've made strong, <laughs> who's made strong I know, right, so yeah. that. I'll have to I'll have to circle circle back to it. Um, but West Marches was originally proposed, and and I think he used the term West Marches in a blog. Um, so if you Google you know West Marches, you can kind of find these descriptions of it. Um, but the West Marches campaign is basically conceptually it's a shared campaign with one or more GMs and a floating cast of players, and when the players you know, hit a critical mass. So players will communicate with each other and they'll say, hey, I want to go explore these ruins to the west of the oasis that we found last session. Or, you know, um, you know, there's this, there's a village and they were reporting that they were under attack by some kind of creature. I want to go hunt down that thing and get some glory. That kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it tends to be more player-driven and actionable from a player perspective and it's episodic so it's it the campaign is character driven and therefore player driven rather than a railroad like you would find in storm king's thunder or even maybe the scarlet citadel by cobalt press Mm -hmm. um it's it's less 
less directed and more sandbox slash open world. So it's more Skyrim, uh, you know, less Mickey's Castle of, Castle of Illusion. Oh. Sorry, kiddo. Um, it's okay, I already beat that game. It, you did beat it. Um, but yeah, so, uh, you know, that's kind of how I conceptualize it. And that, and uh, it, West March is up. Optionally, I guess optionally, uh, has a level of persistence, right? Mm-hmm. So if Party A gets together and explores the oasis, the, the ruins to the west of the oasis on Monday, and Party B decides to go explore the ruins to the west of the oasis on Friday, and Party B is just walking into the ambush has been set for whoever comes back from parties a exploration right so uh it i didn't explain that too well but basically like if party a you know if one group explores an area and cleans it out um it's cleaned out for the rest of the groups it's persistent it's mm-hmm. the npcs aren't going to magically regenerate it's not like an mmo where if you wait you know two hours um your m bosses and your your treasure and your dungeon will regenerate back to full right um it's a level of persistence and it's a level of maybe simulationist or realistic rpg in the way that you know uh sword wielding barbarian accompanied by a magic spell singing wizard can be any kind of realistic Mm -hmm. now with that in with that in mind I know that I, while you while you're um while you're going with that cam- with that campaign style, um, it sounds like you're trying to be um set a bit not quite setting agnostic but leaning a little more into that direction than having a set setting. If I'm if I'm reading you correctly, no, I think you're totally correct. Yeah, and actually, it is uh is as setting agnostic as I can make it. Mm-hmm. Um, I I. Get pigeonholed there a little bit, right? And that um, I think there's a natural inclination of people of humanity to create stories, and to create stories, you have to create worlds. You have to have a world that your story exists in. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have a world, you create a world. I mean, that's like a human uh action right is to kind of tell a story about the world that is or was or will be Mm -hmm. um and so i'm having to really stop myself from casting any kind of reality or setting or even country and focusing really on here is how things work um and there may be a setting book later i don't know right um or there may be um something else later i'm not sure i do know that there has been um, I put out a, a a question to my backers for the project, and I said, "Hey, um, if you were interested in one of these two things, uh, which ones would you be interested in?" And and one uh, item A, the first item was a computer game based on the two D six system. Kind of going back to to uh, the Traveler game, or I envisioned it almost like Wastelands One from like nineteen eighty eight or so. Right, like a simple, simple computer game. Um, and then number two was, are people interested in kind of a uh, fighting fantasy 2D6 solo book kind of thing? Um, and I was really expecting that people would be like, yeah, computer games. Um, but I was, like so many other times, proven totally wrong. Uh, almost all of my backers who left a comment, and there's probably at least 30 comments now, mm-hmm. who said, we don't want computer games, but that solo book idea is sure attractive. Right? And it gave me a really clear idea of, um, I mean, it's basically like, a, hey, hey, you know, if you're going to do one of these two, don't go making a computer game, you're wasting your time. Um, and I, I love... And a choose your own adventure books. I, I actually have released two on itch. They're HTML5 based and they're basically 
They are choose your own adventure books that you can play through. They're visual novels, I guess is the term mm -hmm. that they use. But I released two visual novels that are RPGs um, on itch uh, on on Timurabren is my itch handle, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and you can play them for free. I mean, I I I, I don't want to lock stuff behind paywalls unless I really kind of have to. Um, you know, so uh, yeah, they're free, and you can play them and check them out. Um, and so I I when when my backers kind of said, hey, you really want solo books um, using this two D six system, then. Of course, my my mind. I, I I recalled playing the Lone Wolf books. I recalled playing the Summerland, you know, the the, the Summerland books and the Lone Wolf and the final the fight the fighting fantasy and all those, uh, you know, two d six based kind of a simple adventure book. And I love those. Mm -hmm. I love those when I was a kid. Um, and you know, the thought that maybe that's still a thing that would be popular now. Um, was eye opening to me. Like I, I well, hadn't considered it. You, um, you should, you should get in contact with Jacob D. C. Ross because he's he's been fly, he's been flying the flag for the last few years regarding regarding um regarding solo books. He even kickstarted two of them. Oh, nice, nice. Oh. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not just saying. I'm not just shilling for him because he's one of my friends. But um, he he has he very much is doing is doing what he can to keep to keep that flag flying yeah maybe maybe after this you can put me in touch with him and we can have i can chat with him that would um, be fantastic like oh my gosh you know many hands make for light work so yeah i'm not going to make any promises on that front obvi obviously because i'm a lot of things but i'm not a miracle worker but no, I'm totally. I'd I'd be more than happy to talk to him and you know ask his advice if he's willing to give it. So, mm -hmm. and know. now, one of the in, one of the infamous things in the Ce in the Cepheus system, which I believe somebody else had used it to do a cyberpunk game, um, is of course life paths. And Traveler is the most infamous of all with this because you run the risk of your character dying before you even start. Right. Um, have have you given thought to implementing a life path system with it within um, Westlands, or what? Or uh, did you decide that it might be adding too many pages? No. Oh. So Westlands very much leans on sort of Cepheus, so it has the similar or the same life path system that Cepheus has. The mm -hmm. sort of Cepheus has. Um, what I did do is. Um, you know, the number one problem that I encounter with Sword of Cepheus and Traveler in general, it's not just Cepheus, I mean, it's, it's it's all the Traveler 2D6 system. The life path is very convoluted, it's complex, it's hard to really understand. And even walking through a demo is not as clear as it should be. Um, and that's just kind of an artifact of the game from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Um. And it, you know, it's very random. And so I, I have a kind of, I actually have in Westlands basically a 10 step quick start character, right? And it removes the life path kind of quizzicality. Um, and instead it just says, you know, you have these stats, assign them to your attributes. Mm -hmm. um, you get this many skills at plus zero, you get this many skills at plus one, you get this many skills at plus two. You know, basically, pick a career path. Uh, you get this many skills. There's no, there's no, there's no, um, there's no terms of service. There's no mustering out, right? It's just very streamlined. But in it, using it, you can make a character in five minutes and hit the ground, right? Mm. So rather than spend an hour random rolling and getting really confused, Using the quick start rules, you can just make a character in five or ten minutes and start playing. Um, so that's the trade off. Um, but you know, it basically says, yeah, you have these attributes, you have these skills, you have a uh, hundred gold, you know, a hundred a hundred coins to start buying your equipment. You have one ally and one enemy. Work with 
your referee to figure out who they are and go. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. And since you mentioned careers, um, I think a, a lot of people will look at a lot of people look at careers and they either think the um, labyrinthine career system that was in Warhammer or some variation of character class or in the or in the case of Rollmaster more like character archetype but I'm getting ahead of myself. How do you hand how do you handle careers with your with your take? Oh gosh, careers are like um basically what you've done, but they they almost in no way define your character moving forward. I mean, I, I kind of imagine adventurers as defaulting to down on their luck uh here today gone tomorrow um you know we may have we feast today and we we have famine for the next week um so i don't see adventures as uh in any way a fixed career path nor do i see adventures as really saying um oh, i i was a priest i am always a priest i will be a priest five years from now you know um or you know i was i was a i was a vagabond i'm still a vagabond and that's always what i'll be right it's, it's very less definitive um so a career is is much more how it explains how you got your skills mm -hmm. um and personally i think the best part of the career paths are the life events Right, um, which I think add a lot of depth to the character and the life events in in Cepheus, Sword Cepheus, and Westlands remind me more of kind of things you find in Forbidden Lands, Free League's Forbidden Lands, right, mm -hmm. where you have um, events that not only give you skills and maybe starting equipment, but they give you a, a purpose or they tell a story or they tell part of a story, or they craft uh, an element that is part of your character. That way you can use that going forward to kind of guide yourself if you have a, a moral or ethical choice or, you know, um, whatever have you, right? So, so careers are in no way even needed, honestly. If you use the quick start rules, you don't use them. Mm-hmm. Besides, just it de it determines what skill bucket your skills come out of, um, you know, because because each career typically has a set of skills assigned to it, uh, you know. But the life events are much more story focused, and and I don't know, I I I'm I'm of an age where I take a lot less joy in wanton killing in RPGs. Um, and I take a lot more glee out of the story successes and failures that arise from sometimes this mundane activity. Uh, so I view RPGs now m more as a collaborative storytelling and much less XP accumulating game, right? Mm -hmm. um, the um, way you're describing it, it sounds like you'd lean more towards careers being... Um, archetypes. Sure, sure. They're they're definitely not a uh, definitive. They're not like a D and D class. By well, that means, right? that's why I that's why I brought up archetypes, and that's also why I brought up um something like role master. With whether and in particular, it's spin it's spin offs like against the dark master, which is more recent, or the classic Merp Middle Earth role playing, and yeah. in those. Um, what you, there are certain, there, there's kind, there's kind of a point spread that you're going to be getting at every, at every level, but how you spend that in each of the categories is up to you and certain archetypes are going to get more in certain fields than others. Right. 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 And I mean, and keep in mind that the 2D6 systems are not level based in any way, shape or form, right? They're mm -hmm. experience point based. So uh, you spend experience on skills or abilities or whatever um, in order to gain them, but you don't at any point, you know, level up and suddenly gain unlock a whole bunch of abilities. Yeah. I mean, the other part is, at least in the games that I run, XP accumulation is 
not really quick, right? It's maybe one point per session. And it takes anywhere in between five to ten experience points to really make a substantial change to your character. Um, so it's a much slower and less uh, less accelerated, right, uh, increasing of your abilities. Which, I can certainly get that. However, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that there are going there are going to be various um, ways that people approach uh, that people approach the table, or even ways that people would approach um, board games. Or um, I remember gr I remember growing up, everybody I knew had some variation of house rules when it came to playing Uno. To the point sure. to the point that there was I remember when I, in high school there was a special version of Uno that collected a bunch of different people's house rules, um, and same thing applies with just about every other, every other of those classic board games that we ended up going with. Even even Monopoly, we ended up doing house rules in our attempt to try and speed things up because okay. mm -hmm. if the game only ends when one person goes bankrupt, um, if everybody knows what they're doing, you could have a game la you could have a game so long that you feel yourself age. <laughs> that's right. That's, that's right. I suddenly have. You know, nine o'clock shadow from playing Monopoly, exactly. And yeah, um, but the question that I wanted to get at is: Are you is throughout the throughout the book? Have you put in suggestions for optional rules to emphasize leaning into other playstyles, whether whether someone wants to make the game harder or easier? Oh yeah, actually, um, that was kind of one of my objectives is to. And, and, you know, I, I really like that approach in the Cubicle 7's oh Warhammer... God, set house on fire. Oh, Sims are setting stuff on fire. Uh, Warhammer 4th Edition, the Fantasy 4th Edition, um, mm -hmm. they have a lot of optional rules, right? Cubicle 7 has a ton of optional rules packed in their Warhammer Fantasy setting. Um, and they're very clear that, you know... Uh, Use all or none or anywhere in between. You know, they're 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 basically a toolbox, not a definitive rule set. And yeah, I have rules for um, spell casting. I have rules for critical hits. If you want to have a critical hit system, it's very simple. It's basically add a damage on a box card's result on an attack. Uh, in that critical hit, I even have a sub rule for like, hey, if you want a more heroic game, then only your player characters can score critical hits, right? To kind of equalize out bigger fights. Um, I have rules that I have added for adding templates to creatures. So, you know, say you have a, a a troll, you can add a Chthonian template. Then, barring the Pathfinder template system right so but it's more streamlined than the pathfinder mm -hmm. templates so you know if you want a stone troll you add kind of the rocky template or you want a you know sewer troll you have the plague template or you know whatever have you frost template that kind of thing um i have some optional rules for not only humanoids so because uh sort of cvs actually didn't have any Humanoid stat blocks for enemies or creatures, right? It was assumed that they existed, but there was no generic NPC thug. There was no generic NPC soldier. No generic NPC sorcerer or crossbow wielder, mm -hmm. archer. Um, so I added those in, and then I added in a little bit of extra stuff. So if you want to make an elf archer, you can do that. It's a pretty simple modification. It's like a plus to dex and a minus to con, and they are good at sneaking, or they're good at hiding in the woods. Or you want to you, you know, want to make a halfling or a gnome or a dwarf soldier, you can do that. And it's just a quick little, you know, nudge here and change there. Um, and it it's enough to add an element of change to the mechanics, but not so much that you're stuck redesigning the creature. Um, mm -hmm. And I have templates. I have some new creatures. Like, I, I included the stats for the Lenorm, uh, which is, you know, the Pathfinder 3 armless, wingless uh, serpentine dragon. Um, so I have that in there as kind of a fun, huge fight. Um, 
Let's see, I have optional rules for firearms, but mm-hmm. only three. Only pistols, only muskets, only um, blunderbusses, right? So rather than redesign tech levels one through five for CPS, I just kept it to three simple ones and made a note that not only are they optional, they may be relatively rare or even just unique. Mm-hmm. Um, and I borrowed a lot of the stats for those firearms out of uh, CPS Deluxe, right? So mm-hmm. so the stats should look familiar to um, people who are familiar with, you know, sci-fi 2d6. Mm-hmm. Um, gosh, I think of... I mean, there's a couple of other things in there, too. Like, there's the, the quick start rules. There's optional rules for using stamina and lifeblood from CPS Deluxe, which is basically a streamlined damage tracker so it's just endurance instead of uh, instead of you know all your stats together um i replaced so the the soc the social with charisma a cha which makes a little more sense in social status and also i charisma is feeding into sorcery a little bit Mm-hmm. Um, so it makes more sense to have charisma, but you know, I make sure to spell out that charisma is probably one of the bigger changes. I make sure to spell out that charisma is not appearance, it's kind of a personal gravitas or a personal presence, right? So mm-hmm. a creature or, or being or person may be hideous to behold, but have an irresistible personal magnetism, even if they're, you know, twisted and malign. So. Mm-hmm. Now, with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a total page count? Oh, um, gosh, I don't know. I'd have to look and see where I'm at now. Um, let me see where I'm at now. Actually, I can tell you, tell you what I have, and a lot of it, like I said, is leaning on existing material. So it's not like I'm redesigning. I like I'm rewriting the whole book. Um, let me see if I can find my file. I'm sitting at my computer. Uh, that's an adventure. Uh, give me two seconds. Um, and I, I don't imagine this will be color. It'll be very oaky start. Um, and then as things progress, I may make a more um a prettier version or um you know uh right now it's a very i mean it's it's, it's backing for a dollar so mm-hmm. it's not it's 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 what you would expect to get for a dollar maybe a little bit more i have a couple of extra things i'm throwing in there it's about 150 pages currently um so I would estimate you're probably going to be expecting roughly 150 pages, um, more or less, mm-hmm. right? Not less. I don't see less, but uh, not a whole lot more. Um, so in between 150 and 160 to 70 pages. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Yeah. Um... I'm going to see we're in April. Probably, so Kickstarter, I think the Kickstarter wraps up next week. Uh, and after that, Kickstarter has like this couple of week grace period where they figure everything out on their end. Um, so I my estimate would be early May. Early to mid-May is probably my release window. Mm-hmm. And I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it how it turns out. Um, especially since you can say you can say that it is a in, it is not an April Fool's joke when it comes around. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> but with that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more and um Anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. 
As I often say around here, when I don't fuck up my own outro, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me on. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a pleasure. I look forward to maybe speaking with you next time I do another interesting release. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took, took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>